Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Great Mondays Radio. Today, we have experienced designer Liberty Plank on. Uh, she is, um, well, experienced. As an experienced designer, she's been um, all around uh, a lot of different interesting organizations. And most recently, she was head of employee experience at Gusto and has a lot to share with us, kind of intersecting that, like, what does it mean to be an experienced designer? And was her reflection on culture uh, looking at it from that way? Liberty, thanks for coming Hello. on. Great thanks Mondays Radio. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. So this is a long time coming. Been been trying to get you to, <laughs> to come on for a while. Um, so thank you very much for time, your time. Um, so uh, what's what's an experienced designer? Probably a lot of people already know, but let's start there. Let's talk about experience design and how you found yourself there so that then we can bridge to kind of employee experience. Yeah, definitely. As you kind of mentioned, I have a really unique background. I worked in consumer products at Apple. I worked in music with Justin Bieber, film, Pixar animation studios. I also worked in venture capital with Peter Thiel. And I think a lot of those roles, I was a personal assistant, chief of staff type role. And mm -hmm. after about a decade of working in that space, kind of honing in some of those soft skills, I really felt compelled to pivot to design a hard skills toolbox. It kind of felt like that's what I was missing to take my career to the next level. And I was watching an episode of Abstract on Netflix, and it was the very last episode about a woman named Ilsa Crawford. And they kept referring to her as an experienced designer, and they kept talking about how she was so intentional about the materials she used and the sounds and the environments she was creating. And a light bulb went off for me, and I said, that's the thing I do. That's the thread that when you look at my resume and you go, what has this person been doing? That's what I've been doing in every job I've had. Mm -hmm. I love thinking about who's the customer, whether that's a person or a group of people and saying like, what makes them tick? What makes them feel loved or belonging? What helps them be more effective in their world, whatever that looks like. And so I kind of just started pursuing like, what does that look like in the next phase of my career? And so I got an MBA in design strategy at California College of the Arts. That's how we met. And I was at working at Apple at the time and they really worked with me to start shifting the work I was doing to reflect what I was learning in school. And so I started thinking about product strategy and what the that customer experience is in that product strategy. And then I went on to Gusto to sort of reflect the remote experience and how we work at Gusto. And so the it's kind of, it can be a lot of different things. I think Ilsa Crawford is an interior designer more. Um, and for me, it just is sort of, I'm thinking about what experience I'm creating for people and using yeah. user research and data to sort of hone in those decisions and then iterating and iterating and iterating until you kind of get to that ideal experience and you honestly you always keep iterating <laughs> so right of course yeah 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 um so when we're thinking about then uh, now let's 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 kind of focus in on turn the turn the focus um onto this idea of the employee experience was that at gusto was that your first time applying these experience design skills to the inside of an organization in a way, as my specific job title, when I was at Apple, I did I spent a lot of time thinking about how our team was working and whether that was how we crafted presentations when we were giving them to Tim Cook, like creating the infrastructure of how does the slide look and do we all use the same slide? What information is on there? Um, better organizing, like I worked in design ops for a while of figuring out how are we organizing information to make it easier to get work done. And so I think I had already been doing that as, but not from an HR people seat. Mm -hmm. And Gusto was the first time I had ever sat in a people seat. I was usually on a design or production or engineering team. And so really take like sitting completely outside of the product as I know it and treating the employee experience as a product. So it's my first time doing that. Yeah. So one of the elements that I find really fascinating about your unique perspective on the employee experience is this idea of culture being first and foremost about how you actually get the work done. Can you talk a little bit about how you came to that realization and what it what it means? Yeah, I think that I think about it kind of like the employee hierarchy of needs and sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs at the baseline is do, do people feel effective at the work they're doing? Do they have the tools and information that they need? Yeah. Are they able to easily work cross collaboratively? Um, and I think that 
I saw that be a huge pain point. And basically every company I've ever worked at where we're dealing with silos, like even before the pandemic, that was a problem. It was, it was hard to, to break up silos of work. Yep. We had a lot of different teams using tools that worked for them, but then that made it really hard if someone new from a different part of the company joined and they never used that tool. Um, and so I think there's a lot of things like, I think, sure, having, you know, beer bashes and really fun things are great. But I also think that at a baseline, if people don't feel successful at work, then it's hard that those things don't matter. I think as much like they're, they can be gasoline on a fire if it's already raging. But to me, like that's employee satisfaction. That's like, I feel in flow. I feel happy and excited that I'm doing impactful work, that I have success in the work I'm doing. And yeah, I think we just oftentimes don't look as closely at that. And part of that is I think nobody knows who owns that problem. Um, and that's something I've seen a lot too, is kind of like some people will raise their hand, but it's rarely someone's job to say, how are we getting work done as a company? Yeah. So. I mean, it, it's to me, you're right. It's been a long time that that's really a, a, a thing. And mm-hmm. I, I flash back on, there was some statistic I can't, maybe I'll go find it, but <laughs> there was some statistic about one of the things that the biggest drivers of um, dissatisfaction is not s- understanding the impact that your work is doing. And it aligns really closely for me with this kind of, um, you know, for a while, pre-pandemic, we were talking about um, millennials, like wanting to have purpose and needing to find that job that really has purpose. There's, there is something, there's a, there's sort of an invisible thread that connects those two ideas of like, what am I actually doing? What am I spending my time on? And is it coming to, is, is am I being as, as effective as I can? Because I think ultimately that's what we all want yeah. is to be yeah. able to be effective, right? It's not yeah. just punch in, punch out. Even if it's not, even if your work isn't your life, totally. which I've been having these conversations, you know, there's sort of post quiet quitting and all that. So when you talk about, is it easy? Maybe it's not easy, but maybe easy is the wrong word, but I, can I get my work done without spending extra, too much extra energy on the things that don't matter? Yeah. It's also even like, I would say it's, it's that, and it's also even feedback, which I know is a, (laughs) could be a hot topic, but I think that I've worked at lots of companies where your metrics for success aren't visible to you. And so sometimes you're being measured and you have no idea how, and so you're kind of like, I'm, so it's a mix of like, am I effective? And is that, is that effectiveness leading to impact? And so I think a lot of times like that's, where I think we misalign feedback and personal success metrics. Like I think about one of the job teams I had, we really actually honed in on our, our metrics as a team for success were as a team. So if one person Mm. wasn't pulling their weight or whatever, and it was like, none of us got the bonus. It was like, we all had to agree together. Like we're in this together. We're going to figure it out. And it's kind of, we've seen a shift sort of this like culture of we versus me. And I think we just lost. It's kind of like, how am I doing versus like, how are we all doing? Like, I think we all want to belong to something bigger than ourselves. We want to feel like what we do do matters. Even if, like you said, if it's not my whole life, but I still spend a lot of my time at work and I want to feel like I'm adding value in some way. And so I think that that's where it can really matter and compound is like, not only am I easy, is it easy for me to do the job, but am I getting the feedback that that work is successful or impactful? Couple, couple points in there. So, should we have team KPIs? Is that gonna, is that going to start to solve some of that? I guess the human part of easy to get work done, or, or a, you know, allowing me to get work done, right, Lori? It's like mm-hmm. a team yeah. KPI. I don't know. I, I hadn't. I'm sure it's out there. I hadn't heard the term. But is that, is that kind of what we're talking about? I think it's more what you were saying earlier about the visibility into the work that I'm personally doing. Like, how is that impacting my broader team? And one how of the is, things- How is my work, how is what I'm doing helping- Individually or collectively. Individually yeah, or co- helping the team. 
Yeah. And I think especially actually in, in people teams and it teams, sometimes it's hard when you're, when your job is what we call like keeping the lights on or sometimes keeping the business sexy, like the things that you have to do to keep the business going that aren't necessarily your traditional, like, you know, churn rates or like customer acquisition or, or revenue metrics. I think it's really hard for teams in a company to say like, what's my success, my job, my, my role is to show up and like, keep the lights on and keep the business going. Mm. And so I think, especially for teams like that, and even for those other teams, like, I think that's why the, like, for example, Asana has really thought through how they map that because they saw the value of like, you can actually see your individual task and see what KPI or metric it's tied to, how that ties to an overall objective, a company goal. And when that check happens, like that percentage mark ticks for the whole company. And there is something really powerful about even in that, keeping the the lights on, you know, that sector, like seeing that that actually does matter when a company prioritizes, like that, that is a metric of success is keeping the lights on and like, you know, finding ways to improve the way we do that. So it's not just the same thing every day. So visualizing, right? So you're, you, you were saying it's, well, it's invisible and that's, that's problematic because you could be doing having an impact, but you just don't know it. And now I'm going back to this past weekend. I went to, uh, I took my daughters to uh, Mm Comic-Con and, you know, I got to experience, there was a lot of folks that are into these games and the tabletop games. And then there's the digital versions of the games. So when you talk about Asana saying this thing is connected to this thing, and then when you take it off, you sort of see it, that progress bar Mm -hmm. go forward. I think about that, right? It's like, I know we've, I know, you know, the gamification of everything was (laughs) something that we talked about 10 years ago, but this to me is the, the vet, like the reason why we love games is Mm -hmm. because the, what we're trying to accomplish is very clear. Mm -hmm. And when we accomplish it, we get feedback, right? Yep and, and, and celebrations and, you know, whatever, little vibrations and little things, right? Like, so we don't have that. And that's, and like, we're, maybe you could have, you know, when we're thinking about the assembly line and you're like Mm -hmm. stamping out steel and it's like, well, I did this many numbers of things, but we're in such, you know, um, uh, de, uh, sort of dematerialized world. What the hell am I doing? <laughs> yeah. Right. Where's that like, progress bar? What is that? Yeah. yeah I want to mm-hmm. promise. We need to make the invisible mm-hmm. visible and that is going to help me stay yeah. connected. Mm-hmm. So then move that, move that forward to, okay. So we need to define what it is that I'm, that, that we're doing and what is it, what does success mean? And then how do you visualize it? Um, so that's one piece of it. It what else is what are the other aspects of getting what you like you say, like getting work done, making it possible for getting for helping people get their work done. We've talked about uh, a little bit aligning with the team, yep. visual or making those connections, visualizing it. What else? I think a big one, it's kind of maybe twofold, but is around tooling. Like I think that there's it's during the pandemic, we overdid it with tools. I think uh, everybody can agree with that. We were like, let's use a tool to solve all of our problems. Yeah. And in some instances, it helps a lot. And in other instances, we ended up with tool fatigue, which is, you know, a company has five different project management tools that they're using. And so if you're someone who works across multiple teams, you're having to master or not, not having the ability to master all five of those tools and then Mm. waste time translating your work from one tool to the other and having to learn it. And I think the same is true. The other part of that is around information. And I think that was something actually that was a big aha moment for me when I worked at Apple, where I realized that there was so much power in not wasting time to prepare presentations for work that's being done, which Sounds sounds crazy because everyone does it, but this idea that if I could hold my meeting in the tool where the work is actually being done, I don't waste time doing it. I it's up to date all the time. And so for leaders, I mean, there were so many times where it's like you get a ping on a Saturday or Sunday, like what's the status on this project? And it's like, well, you were preparing to do the the presentation Monday, so you haven't shown it yet. And versus like we built a dashboard that was where everyone did the work. We agreed this is where you update things, where you track things and all. And so 
a leader could pop in at any time, not having to text you on a Saturday or Sunday and say like, what is the status? What are the blockers? Where, what are the notes from the last meeting? And and also mm-hmm. here's a high level, whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I do think, and I think about this, especially with AI, where I think that AI is so powerful in surfacing information that already exists. And I think that that's where there's a lot of fear around using AI at work. I've seen it a lot myself. And I think there's this feeling of getting replaced and like, how is this going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to be obsolete. And I think the reality is like, what's going to replace people is not AI. It's people who know how to use AI to be more effective. And I think that is a really big one where it's kind of, if the information lives on your internet, people shouldn't be wasting time trying to find it. You should just have a a system where they can ask, Hey, I need help with this. Or, you know, and like, I think from an employee experience perspective, I think of it like this clean interface where it's just, you know, one spot where you go to ask all the questions you need about being an employee, whether that's how you're working, whether that's benefits, whatever that is. And then sure, of course, there's going to be complexity on the back end, but internally we own that complexity. We don't put it on the employee because that's wasted time. And so I think that that's where sometimes we're like, well, there's all these different things. And it's kind of like, yeah, but that's like, it shouldn't take someone 45 minutes to get approval, to use an application, to do their job. Like those are the kind of things that I think are just like tiny moments of friction that, that grind at people over time. And it might not be the reason they quit specifically, but it's like that slow drip of dissatisfaction over time of like, God, it's just so hard. I feel like I'm constantly hitting roadblocks every time I hit flow. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you went from, okay, let's all choose the same tool, which I think everybody goes, yeah, obviously. And we would like that. It's not, you know, it's, it's not, not easy. Like, it's, <laughs> no, it's not easy. Not. Yeah. But it, it's, it's, you know, it's obviously something that makes sense to what if there was some sort of, you know, clean layer on top of any of that, that allows you to find using AI to find the information that you, that you need. It's almost like when we switched, it's almost like when, um, Apple put in the search bar in your Mac. Yep. Like, that's what I remember. Cause yes. I remember, I remember like really meticulously organ trying to keep, trying yeah. <laughs> to keep my folders meticulously organized Labels. fail, fail, yeah. fail labels and tech, yeah. but it's like, and then at some point, right. Like it's, you know, I was still doing this. So the next piece was that like Google drive and I was still doing it. And then I had, um, one of my, uh, one of the people that I worked with, she's a millennial and like, she would never go into Google drive and do the search. She would just be in her, her bar, her search bar and just type in whatever the thing. And I was like, Oh shit. So it's like, that's (laughs) so efficient. Right. And so you're, what you're talking about is like, Hey, let's stop creating an extra, there's the extra step to present Mm -hmm. what we've been doing. How do you enable, I think the two things here is like, how do you um, do the work in a way that is exposed Mm -hmm. so that anybody can find the information that they need at any point? Yeah. And it, we're moving too quickly to stop and do a presentation and that's yeah. for the next thing. Um, and especially, I mean, I can understand it for clients, right? Like sure. I think, yeah. you know, there is more and more where like invite your client into Slack, right? That's sort yeah. of like stepping it forward, but, and you need to do some storytelling and, and, and um, course, yeah. you know, clarification, but what you're talking about internal teams, it's like, Hey, let's just like, it's so such a waste of time. How do we create more efficiency? And I'll build on this and say the, you know, AI and and the cheap cloud storage and all this stuff, right? We're recording all these calls, like every one of my calls is recorded and I can always go back. So now we have the, a way of like really documenting all these things and finding that information. And it's, um, it's interesting, right? So ultimately what you're talking about is reducing that cognitive overhead, right? Like obviously yep. there's time, but it's like energy of finding this thing. Like, yeah. let's just 100%. call it up. Because even think about like if you're in Salesforce or something and you're trying to figure out context or you have a question about something about what we're supposed to do and you have to pull up Confluence and dig through that. And I think that there is like I've seen so many tools um, like Grammarly Business is a great example. I am so obsessed with that tool that it's why basic. how is how is so it's very different than Grammarly basic. I don't even know what they call it. Personal. Um it's, it comes right alongside you just like Grammarly does, but what they've done is made it so that it houses information using AI about your company and culture. And so even from a sales or customer service perspective, 
you can have tidbits saved based on common answers. It actually checks your tone and you can build a brand tone. So if you're writing to customers or dra drafting internal comms, you're less likely to need, you know, if you have one comms person, they're trying to review 4,000 people's comms or yeah. two, like, you know, whatever, it's not yeah. scalable. Whereas if that person who's head of comms owns that brand tone on something like Grammarly for people who draft comms, then you kind of know, like, am I on tone, off tone? You can build things in. Like if someone types the word anywhere that they're working user, and it's like, actually here, we use the term customer or something like that. Like it, and it tells you why it gives you the context. It doesn't, you don't have to go, oh, what do we call them? Okay, wait, let me go look that up. And I think it's that like companion tool to the work that we're doing that is either using AI, it's using information we've built into it. Like I think it has to meet you where you're at. And if it's that barrier of friction, if you add another place I have to go where it's like you lay out what the comms expectations are in a Google slide, then I have to remember where that is. I have to go find mm -hmm. it. That means yep. files have to be extremely organized and yep. like they never are. It's always like Docpocalypse. So I think that's where I, I'm excited to see where the future is going in that space. And like, how can we co-pilot people when they're working? So let's tie it back to culture and, yeah. and, and the sort of the definition of like, um, well, my definition is the cause and effect of everything that, that, you know, every decision that we make. So we're talking about those things. And we're also, I heard someone say recently, it's the sort of, um, our culture is like the artifact of, of previous mm -hmm. successes and which I thought was really nice as well. And so we're talking about Ultimately, what I think I haven't thought as much about, which is why it struck me when you brought this idea up of like, oh, it, it's it's so obvious right in front of your face. It's actually enabling people to get their work done. So yes, there's these relationships and that's, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's where my focus has always been is like, how do we get people to understand things similarly and yeah. work together better? And what your sort of zoom on this is is like hey for what reason and yeah. it's we're doing this in order to and if we can reframe this as like how do we do how do we get our work done then you can kind of think about okay well the beer bash is building that relationship so that i can build some trust so that i yep. can right like blow off some steam yeah. or whatever it might be and and so that is is a really interesting facet uh, into which we can kind of think about how we design culture. I wonder, so my question to you is, I've been advocating for, you know, like a chief culture officer because doing it in, you know, HR is like, it's, it's HR is so much to do and that's usually where it sits. Do we need, like you're saying, do we need like a get a chief get work done officer or something like is that yes. a better way to do it like can we make a business case for that I think I think so cuz I think the reason and I I'd be flexible on where that person would sit I feel like you know depending on if a company has a COO or not I do think that they're the the culture seat is so unique because it it's not just one like work silo. And I think that's what makes yeah. it so challenging to get right. And because powerful. It's still, yeah. And, and so powerful when you do get it right, when you start to see partnerships across these different silos to say, all right, we, we co-own this outcome together. Um, and, and the success of that outcome. And I think there, sh there needs to be whatever you call it, somebody whose job it is to think about how are we designing the culture around how we work, how we engage with each other? Like I, even though I was head of remote experience, I so strongly believe that in-person time together is really critical. You need it to build connection. Do you need it every day? No. <laughs> Do you? And I think that's where, you know, designing like intentionality around cadence is really important. Like I've seen time and time again, people forcing people back to the office. I experienced it in both my workplaces of putting a lot of emphasis on office time. And it's kind of like, if people are going into zoom, that is not a good culture. Like if you want, when people are together in person to be spending time together, to be laughing, to be sharing meals. And, and again, like, but it should be for everyone. It shouldn't be for people who live near an office or mm -hmm. only leaders. Like that doesn't yep. trickle down to the rest of the company. I think the way we might think it does. And so I think having like an operational cadence, I mean, we all know when we're, you know, as leaders, even planning businesses, like 
Q4 planning or Q, like there are moments where it would matter more to be in person and you can design around that, whether that's like, Hey, we need to brainstorm and get together to solve this problem or, Hey, someone new on our team is onboarding. Like, how can we meet them and make them feel welcome? And it kind of almost buys you that human capital until the next time. So it's kind of like, but that in combination with actually how you're working, they have to be working together or they're, they're both, you know, in silos and not operating as effectively as they could. Yeah. Yeah. That is, I mean, it, it's, I think that is, it's this cross functional, it's, it's kind of everything. And, Mm -hmm. and that's been, that's been hard. I mean, it's why it doesn't sit well with me. I'm happy to work with and appreciate all the work that HR does, but that's not everything. It's not quite what we, you know, all the stuff that we need to think about. And that's why I feel like it's limited in that way. And I think because it's actually such a hard, sticky problem, unless someone from like a CEO seat says, this is your responsibility. I think because there's so much room for failure, people tend not to raise their hand for it or yeah, of say, course. Yeah. that's not my job. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've heard like, well, that's not the job of our org. I'm like, well, but whose job is it? Yeah. And the answer is like, I don't know. It's like, but it is a problem that needs solving, right? It's <laughs> almost, it, I mean, yeah, yeah exactly. It's, so, it's who, almost, someone needs to be solving this problem. It's almost it's the me. last, it's almost the last task, right? It's the last, mm-hmm. it's, it's impossible in, in, yeah. in, in our current ways of thinking. It's yes. not impossible to do, no, it's but not. in the way it's that not. we, the way that we organize, the way that we have our KPIs, the way that we've organized our, the, the departments and the roles and what we're shooting for, you're going to yeah. get this you know, at, at best, at least, you know, sort of this, like you're spending time looking for things or trying to move things. And at worst where you've got competing priorities and I've seen it, I've seen it so many times like, Nope, this is our thing. And it's like, Mm -hmm. Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. Why, why are we wasting our time doing it like that? That you're, you've missed it entirely. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that we, we, we've come to, I don't know that we've uh, solved the problem, Liberty, but I, I just do highlighted think, it. <laughs> yeah. I think I, you yeah. know, this conversation has been really, really interesting and it's, and it sort of puts a little couple, couple more little lines, you know, added to the story and, and to find it a little bit better, which I really, really appreciate. Um, any final pieces of advice you've, you know, you, you've seen a lot. And I think, I think people, I think our audience listens because some of the, the, the work and the conversations are insightful and, and kind of change minds. Is there any piece of advice that you might offer um, um, someone who runs a group or a department that to help them improve that employee experience and simplify the, the way that work gets done? Yeah, I think, um, recently when Brian Chesky from Airbnb was talking about the sort of like that founder mentality, I think, um, you talking about founder mode. Yeah. Founder mode. Um, and thinking about how a lot of times when we scale up our businesses, we undervalue that mentality. And I think actually that's why this problem is so hard to solve is because it needs a founder mentality. It Mm. needs someone who's thinking about, all the different components. And I think that's why given my background that it's like, I've sat in the C-suite, I've been everywhere. And I, I constantly am thinking about all yeah. the different components that fit together. And you kind of, you need leaders in that space that are, that care a lot about these sticky, hard problems. And honestly, my biggest piece of advice to any team is to form some sort of tiger team, call it what you want, that their job is not tied to the same metrics as everything else, yep. but their job is to to identify, okay, say we get an employee survey back and we realize these flags. Now let's go deep dive into those and understand what's causing that. How do we eliminate those barriers? And then that becomes the success of that team. And then you keep doing it. Cause I think there's so many talented people that ha- that want to do that. And there really isn't a space for them um, because we've gone into this like scale mode. We need specialists. Like, yeah, and yeah. I think as, as a generalist myself, I feel that where I'm like, well, this is being general as a specialty in some ways, you know, I think that there's a <laughs> lot of value there around. I think about, I've sat in all these different seats. I've been work tons of different industries and I'm seeing the same problems. It's, these aren't specific to us. And so I think just dedicating resources 
that aren't can, can't get pulled away to do other things to focus on those problems, you'll start to see a lot of traction really quickly on those things. It's a problem that can't be solved by one team or department. It's too big of an issue yep. and it needs to be understood and the permission needs to be given mm -hmm. to do this work from, yep. from the, from the top. Yeah. It's it, too, because it's too risky yep. otherwise. Yep. And it's too risky for leaders to buy into it too. If they're not really sure where, you know, you can have a relationship with them. Sure. You can invest all this time, but if they're not like my success is tied to this as well, then it's not a priority. And so you have to find a way. Yep to pull in the different lenses, like every, especially like up in the C-suite, you need a tagger team of people that are, that have influence across the company and insight into different problems that are being had that can go in and, and ask hard questions with context. And I think that's, um, super, super valuable to getting this problem solved and to making the business successful, which is ultimately what leaders want also. So. <laughs> By the way, don't forget that part. Yeah. I mean, like that to me, I'm like, don't, that that is the key to unlocking a more successful business is people can be more effective and get work done. Like that, the idea around productivity yeah. just is like, I hate that word because we don't really know what it means. We say all these different things. And that's why I really love the idea of effectiveness. Cause it's kind of like, we all can, we all know what that means. Like we know when we're feeling ineffective or effective and like in flow, like I love my husband's an engineer. So he always is like, I'm in flow or like, I can't get to flow or whatever. And that's such yeah. a big unlock for him. And I think that that's as humans, we want to feel like this is just working and there's something really yep. invigorating and energizing about that. I, I agree. I agree. Uh, experience designer, Liberty Plank. <laughs> if you want to connect and nerd out more about getting work done, um, she is out and about on LinkedIn. Just you can search for Liberty or Liberty K, the letter, uh, and you'll find her there. She's always posting interesting things. Uh, Liberty, thank you so much for coming on Great Mondays Radio. Yeah. This was really insightful. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's sorry it took so long. <laughs> so happy to <laughs> finally got you be now. here. Got you now. Yeah, thanks. I love it. Appreciate it.